And thank you for all you do I'm, as a physician. Thank f thanks for all you do in, in creating new drugs and, and helping regulate them. Um, it's actually a nice pleasure to be back in the, in the Bay Area, or the DC area. I came here from the Bay Area, a little jet lagged. It's 4 a.m. for me. Um, I actually grew up in Silver Spring, and I got my scientific career down the road at NIH, um, where in high school I had the opportunity to do a little internship and um, got to do a science fair project the next year based on some of the basic stuff I did in the lab. And it's always fun to tell the story that my little first publication, uh, a way to use anti-IG monoclonal antibodies to block IG-mediated histamine release, won the Montgomery County Science Fair two years in a row, published it, didn't think much about it, you know, actually won this international science fair, went off to college and med school, and then got called by Genentech, who was in a patent dispute at the time, and said, by the way, what happened to that initial paper? Because that idea turned into, into Zolaer which is a, a pretty good drug. And I visited Genentech once, and I said, you know, I'm here for my royalty check, because I didn't know anything about, <laughs> about regulatory reimbursement. So that's my, that's my experience in developing drugs. Um, but what I want to talk to you about this morning isn't the title I think you have in there. I'm not going to exactly talk about quality or drug shortages. But what I want you to do is start thinking differently about where, where technology uh, can take um, the future of medicine and the future of, of healthcare and the implications of that for the, for the regulatory and the, and the pharma industry. And before I thought we sort of look into the future, I thought we'd go back and take a look back to the future a little bit. Um, after I did medical school at Stanford, I was lucky to do a residency in both internal medicine and pediatrics at Massachusetts General Hospital. And I was back there about a year and a half ago. We had the 200th anniversary of MGH. It was a, a chance to reunite, reunite with the, the house staff that I trained with, the guys and gals I went to war with. This is before those little 80-hour work week restrictions. And of course, being in Boston, some of you are from Boston, uh, uh, we got to joke about walking uphill both ways in the snow. And uh, after one of the receptions there, I found myself in one of the most famous spots of healthcare history, if anyone recognizes that. That is the ether dome. That's the spot where in 1846, this was the very lucky first patient to get general anesthesia with a surgery. No, before that, they literally bit the bullet. And I, I don't think they had an FDA back then, but they did it anyway. And uh, if you go back to the ether dome today, in the back case, you can still see the actual sponge. The room is sort of frozen in time from 1846. We have some special grand rounds and some M&Ms. So it's, you know, unchanged. Um, I wandered down the hall about four minutes away at Mass General to the ward where I spent my first month as a brand new intern in the mid-90s, and that actually was frozen in time as well. We had the same alarms beeping, a little PTSD, some of the same uh, nurses, some of the same patients. Um, <laughs> the only difference was that, uh, you know, it's exactly the pictures, looked exactly the same. Uh, the only difference was the poor intern was pushing around a cart now with an old computer, had to print out the electronic medical record and put in the paper chart, and orders were still faxed to the pharmacy. So I thought, you know, even at Man's Greatest Hospital, a lot of healthcare was still sort of stuck in, not quite the 1800s, but like we've been practicing it for a long, long time in silos and buckets defined by departments and, and old fiefdoms, and, and often the data and the medicine is being um, uh, restricted in, in ways it's thought about. We still sit in, uh, in waiting rooms, for example, uh, the same, way, same, same ways we did in the, in the 1800s. So that's sort of, I think, right for change and for reinvention. And, and that applies not just to the practice of clinical medicine, but how we develop drugs and how we regulate them. And we have to think differently. And we're not just a, a bucket of body parts or a bunch of ologies. We're, this is the molecular and genomic age, right? And the connected and the digital age of medicine. And it's time for us to think differently. And that has a lot of challenges, particularly for those in the regulatory sphere. But it's going to enable us to address some of the big challenges, I think. Obviously, the aging, aging demographic, the issues with access. Even with Obamacare, we still have uh, many uncovered Americans and a huge shortage of primary care physicians. We practice medicine and, and give different drugs for the same issue across different parts of the country. We have lots of big data coming at us, but it's still very fragmented, and we have challenges you know, uh, integrating that. And while a lot of the technologies I'll even touch upon today are sort of here, the challenge is who pays for it, and then how is it regulated? I know many of you are struggling with the fast pace. We've heard about the winds blowing. The winds are blowing faster and faster. How do you end up regulating in the environment where new technologies come up every year and uh, the regulatory process needs to catch up? So meta trends are happening in healthcare, which you're quite aware of. I mean, generally, we, we practice sick care, not health care. That's because we practice not evidence-based medicine, but incentive-based medicine. And that's where the curve is on the left. We, you know, as physicians, often it's fee-for-service. We, we do um, care often when things have already progressed. The incentives are starting to shift with the ACO models and beyond. And technology is starting to enable prevention and wellness in new powerful ways. Another meta trend is where's healthcare happening? You know, increasingly it's moving from the hospital out to the clinic, uh, to our homes, and even onto our own bodies. And technology has an important pl uh, place to role to play in that as well.
Um, and so in that context, if my technology works, um, let's think a bit about where technology is moving and what its implications are. A lot has happened even since I uh, came back to Stanford uh, 12 years ago to do fellowships in hematology and oncology and bone marrow transplantation. And many technologies are moving what I'll call exponentially. You know, our minds, and we've developed over millions of years to think linearly. I take 30 linear steps, one, two, three, four, five, I beat to the exit. If I take 30 exponential steps, doubling every step, two, four, eight, 16, 32, by 15 steps, I'm at 30,000. But at, that's right, 50, at 30 steps, just 15 more steps later, I'm at a billion. That's six times around the planet. And our minds don't often appreciate the power of exponentials. But that's what's happening you know, in terms of like Moore's Law and in terms of IT. You know, the smartphones in your pocket have had a billion times the price and performance of the supercomputers of MIT in the 1970s. Your iPads are the equivalent of a Cray supercomputer from the late 80s. And this creates both opportunity and disruptive stress. And it's clearly not just happening in, in, uh, in IT, it's happening across technology platforms. The, the concept here is a, there's a convergence. It's in IT, it's in big data, it's in artificial intelligence, it's in robotics, 3D printing. And that has interesting implications for health, pharma, and regulatory. Okay, so What's, just to, frame, just to frame things, what's happened even in the last 10 years, right? We've reinvented how we read books. Amazon has disrupted itself. They sell more e-books than regular books. We've changed the way we take photos, for example. Uh, Kodak, by the way, invented digital photography, uh, and now they've gone bankrupt, essentially, and Instagram sold for a billion dollars. So how we, uh, how we, if we don't pay attention to the pace of technology, even that in our own, in our own hands, there's disruption that can happen. And that disruption is happening across many industries. Kodak, RIM technologies, certain elements of pharma are certainly being disrupted. That's being enabled by many of these fast-moving technologies. Certainly, human genomics is one of them. Um, how many folks here have been sequenced or had any kind of DNA testing? Just a few, wow. So you can now for $99 go out and get, you know, your, through 23 or other, 23 me or other services, basically a million, one and a half million SNPs analyzed. And that has really interesting implications. Well, and the price of sequencing has come down at twice the rate of Moore's Law. Today about two, three thousand dollars. Soon it'll be a hundred dollars. Soon it might be almost the equivalent to being free. That's gonna have a lot of disruption in terms of personalized medicine, pharmacogenomics, and beyond. And of course, I've had, my, I've had actually had my exome done for a thousand dollars. The challenge is, when I show up to my primary care physician with my you know, genome on a disc, what do they do? Or what do you do uh, for a clinical trial? So um, <laughs> there's you know, some translational issues, but that's part of the opportunity and part of the challenge. There's even USB chip-based uh, sequencers that'll do point-of-care pharmacogenomics. How's that gonna be regulated? How do we end up dosing and selecting drugs in that regard? And uh, you know, here's my, my prescription to my friend Raymond McCauley with his disc uh, containing his actual genome that came in the mail. So really interesting implications there. It's not just, of course, our genome. It's our low-cost proteome. It's the ability to get environmental data, imaging data, which is layering in new ways, biomarkers, the microbiome. You know, you've heard now about fecal transplants. Oh, who's regulating that? Anyone? <laughs> um, interesting implications there, but that can really be powerful in treating Crohn's disease, maybe, you know, IBD and, and obesity even. So really ch interesting changes in the ability to measure that now for uh, pennies on the dollar. Now, in terms of high-speed computing and Moore's Law, some of the implications have clearly been in imaging now. We can really take a file, a CT scan, and very rapidly show that to a clinician right at the point of care. What used to take days of, of, of data manipulation can be done in real time. So that has implications in the operating room, uh, in terms of modeling, in terms of personalizing therapy uh, in smart new ways. So high-speed imaging is certainly playing a role there. That's starting to layer in the world of neuroscience, not just in understanding our amazing anatomy uh, of our brain at higher and higher resolution, but now the connectome. And as you all may have heard, you know, Obama is, uh, has a new uh, brain mapping initiative. So we're looking at higher levels of the connectome in the brain and beyond. And in some cases using in reverse analyzing the anatomy of, of the brain to, to build the next generation of supercomputers, such as IBM is doing. So huge implications there. Some fields of medicine, as I mentioned, will be disrupted. So for example, uh, cardiology, or at least the diagnostic uh, cardiology, the old way of doing an angiogram, you know, an hour in the cath lab and the diet, et cetera, is going to be supplanted with new ways to take a 30-second CT scan, load that data of the patient to the, to the, to the, of the heart to the, to the cloud, and analyze computationally how narrow is the cor uh, coronary blood vessel. So here we can do what's called the FFRCT, the fractional flow reserve CT. This is a spin out of Stanford called heart flow. They can computationally measure that as well as the gold standard, the actual uh, uh, angiogram, and predict what kind of stent will that patient need and what size, and maybe that can even be 3D printed for that patient. So interesting implications there as we probably reinvent elements of diagnostic uh, radio uh, cardiology, including ways to do a quick 
MRI now, 10 minute MRI, database in the cloud analyzed, and you can completely reconstruct the heart five times better than an echocardiogram, and that can be accessed through your smart tablet or phone. So new ways of leveraging fast technology diagnostics in the cloud. Now, of course, this is all coming in a disruptive way to our pockets. You know, I mentioned the cell phone. Remember, you know, it used to be really, you know, 10 years ago, if you had, you know, a, a Palm Pilot, that was pretty, pretty cutting edge. Um, now, if you don't have an iPad 4, you know, whatever, you know, you're old school. I'm waiting to get my 5S. But imagine what the iPhone 8 will be able to do. It's only been five years since the iPhone came out and three years since the iPad, and about 70% of U.S. physicians have one and bring them to work. It drives their IT folks crazy. But every medical student now at Stanford, where I'm based, gets an iPad their first day of school. That's changing the way the digital natives are using this information and increasingly the patients. And these are now becoming obviously tools, not just phones uh, or smart computers, but diagnostic platforms. So there's several mobile platforms that will do point of care blood glucose readings right on the phone and give them the patient a dashboard to their, for example, their blood glucose levels. And, and the idea of combining drugs, devices, and apps and having dashboards and feedback loops, which didn't exist before, is changing the way we modulate clinical care and have, can, can have dramatic incomes. And of course, I know many of you at the FDA are thinking about how do you regulate these apps? It's one thing if it's an app that, regulate, that measures your exercise, and another thing if it suggests how much insulin to take. So interesting implications there. You don't even need, though, to have a connected device. We can have the patient just enter the blood sugar from a manual glucometer, share that with the physician, let them tweak their glucophage or what have you, and end up dramatically uh, improving their uh, hemoglobin A1C, dropping by two points. So when do we start prescribing apps as opposed to just drugs or drugs and apps together to help modulate their compliance, their personalization, and their follow-up? So really interesting implications and challenges, but opportunities there as well. We're gamifying health. We're, the new drug, in some ways, is the empowered patient. We're empowering patients to get engaged. We're rewarding them for good behavior. At Packard Children's, we had our oncology patients shoot their tumors on a game called Remission, and their outcomes were better. Um, you know, adolescent kids don't often take their 6MP. You know, now they're engaged uh, in new ways, and that can improve survival. We're using off-the-shelf gaming technologies like the Microsoft Connect to you know, make things like physical therapy much more engaging and, and, uh, and fun and interactive. Um, so sometimes we can take cheap technologies and uh, make them more uh, impactful. We're seeing ways uh, in terms of changing the dynamic now of this whole sphere is actually of, of digital medicine. The fact that your information is now being stored in EMRs more currently, we just hit 50% electronic medical records in most hospitals, our, our, our background data, our environmental data, what our phone can tell us. This digitization is really powerful. And again, part of that is being mediated by the smartphone. I mean, we now have a lot of sensors built into these from tracking our eyes, using the camera, um, uh, blood pressure cuffs can be connected. Uh, one of my favorite examples now FDA approved is the AliveCore uh, case. This is a, uh, I believe it only costs about $10, but being sold for about a, 100 or so. Sold with a prescription enables a clinician to, or, or anyone, I've had one for a while, to connect and, and record their EKG directly on their phone live in real time. So that could be used for a patient with AFib. It's used as diagnostics. I passed one around a conference once, and the head of the, the inventor, Dr. Dave Albert, called me back. Who there had the heart block? We had no idea. Um, but it's a screening device. Um, uh, I and others have used this on airplanes and folks have collapsed. Just an example of smart diagnostics coming to your phone. And again, an interesting way to think about regulatory on that. And that's sort of big enabled and started just like in the Bay Area where I'm based, just like the Apple computer came out of the garage. It started with some garage geeks doing this sort of new field of quantified self, which I think is moving to quantified health. The idea that there's a whole sphere of new connected devices and technologies, starting out with ones like the ones I'm wearing. I'm wearing three or four, actually. I can track my steps. Anyone here have a Fitbit or anything similar? Right? Does that change your behavior a bit? When you can see how many steps you have and brag on that on Facebook or Twitter or with your friends or just see that how you're doing, that changes your, your perception and your engagement with your activity. Similarly for even patients with, let's say, hypertension. One in three Americans has hypertension, but less than half of those have, have that well controlled. Now you can walk into an Apple store and for $60 get a connected health blood pressure cuff and enable that feedback loop to happen. And when is that going to get covered by the payers and how might that get regulated when that data comes back to me as a primary care physician? Um, we're seeing an evolution of these sort of sensors 1.0, like the one I'm wearing, to those that are, you know, tattoos that can measure elements of your health. Um, those are getting smaller and faster. In fact, I'm wearing, if you can switch to the other screen on the Alt tab, I'm wearing a little patch right here, a $2 patch in development, that there's my live EKG, hands-free. You can see my heart rate, 114. My stress is only 99%. Good, I got one pretty good. If I run around, <laughs> you'll see my activity here, I think, in a second. If I fall down, uh, there's a little lag, it'll show that I fell down and it'll call my mom or 911. Um, 
let's work on my stress level. I've only had one coffee. Uh, but this is a cheap patch. And imagine when all the patients discharged from a hospital with heart failure, for example, have one, or you use one as a diagnostic, and I can get insight into my data or trends over days, weeks, or months, or it can you know, call 911 before I know I'm having the MI, for example. So lots of implications from these low-cost sensors. How are those going to be regulated? How do we tie those into clinical trials and beyond? If we could switch back. There we go. Thanks. Um, and so there's an explosion of devices, not just for those ones to be worn, but for those for the clinician. The idea of a, a smartphone physical. These are all devices that you can buy off the shelf. How could we use those in smart ways to enhance our clinical trials and drug development? Um, I saw a, a brief story is, you know, you go into an Apple store now and there's, there's 50 devices on the shelf, 25 or 30 connected health devices. So if any of you are interested in trying these out, um, I just launched a little website called Bionic Health. And you can go and find and explore all these devices, see ratings from devices that track your, your posture and beyond. So you can go to bionichealth.com. The code is actually alpha. And you can give it a shot um, if you'd like to try out some of these yourself. OK. So it's not just you know, vital signs. It's now our point of care diagnostics. The world of microfluidics is bringing lab tests to our, to our, to our homes and anywhere on the planet, from checking a drop of blood for malaria to being able to actually print out new versions of, of tests and take a smartphone picture with them and analyze them. Uh, we're really changing the way we can do point of care diagnostics and laboratory measurements. So the idea of a digital checkup from anywhere layered with telemedicine. You know, you can use your smartphone now to have engaged conversations. Some of that's being paid for now by payers. It's changing the way we interact and can do clinical trials. Now, again, it's no one technology. It's the layering of these technologies, the, the connected age, the age of the, um, uh, of the internet everywhere, or the connectome of, of, of data is really impactful. The challenge then becomes, you know, how do we make sense of this? Even our, our, our next generation pacemakers are connected to apps. Most pacemakers or AICDs placed today have, have apps. So there's security concerns. I, I get a call, Dr. Kraft, you know, take out $400 from the bank and drop it off, or I'm turning off your pacemaker, or I'm tweaking your insulin pump, you know. So I, I, I don't want to go there, but there's a dark side, just to be aware of. Um, there's, there's also a question of who owns your own data. This is my friend Hugo, who has an implantable defibrillator, and the company who made it, who may rename rename nameless, didn't want to give him his own data. Who owns the data from your own body? And he had a hard time getting the data from this big drug uh, device company until he had a Twitter exchange with the CEO of the, of the, of the company who was grabbing, gra bragging about his Fitbit data. And soon, all, soon as soon, social media enabled him to get his information. So if we can unsile this information, it'll be, it'll be quite powerful. Now, this is big data coming at us as clinicians, as regulators, as pharma folks. How do we make sense of this? It's really overwhelming. The new opportunity, though, is to layer that with artificial intelligence. Did anyone here see Watson beat the pants off the best champions in Jeopardy? That was just two years ago. Well, Watson has now gone to medical school, right? And some of us doctors are, are a bit, uh, you know, AI. Ooh. I like to call it IA instead, intelligence augmentation, because that's what actually it's meant to do, is to augment the clinician, the physician, the, the drug developer, not to replace us. And it's going to go beyond just sort of smart diagnostics, but all the way to workup suggestions and how to maybe modulate your clinical trials. You need to do phase one, two, and three the same way. There's adaptive clinical trials now. That can layer AI. The whole endeavor of medicine is going to be changed using smart pattern recognition and learning. It's already existing on certain apps and beyond. And as we wear more and more sensors, and there's sort of the internet of things, just like your car has 200 sensors, you don't care about the sensors. You care about when your check engine light goes on. I think in the future, we'll have sort of the on-star for the body that's going to integrate that and have your own personalized check engine light and layer that together in, in smart new ways. So that's coming. All right. How are you going to regulate that? OK. All right. Now, some of this sounds science fiction, right? You remember, remember Bones, right, the tricorder? And you know, the tricorder is coming to our pocket. There's now $2,000 handheld ultrasound devices that can do what a $100,000 ultrasound did a few years ago. And I was involved in the XPRIZE, designing a new XPRIZE around a medical tricorder. It's a $10 million purse sponsored by Qualcomm. If some of you aren't familiar with the XPRIZE, you can go to the Air and Space Museum down the street and see Spaceship One that won the first Ansari XPRIZE to get into space about 10 years ago. And that's opened up the world of commercial flight. You can next year book a flight on Virgin Galactic. Uh, or you've seen SpaceX. It's opened up thinking in new ways. The idea behind the XPRIZE for medical tricorders to build a handheld device that's going to be, I need the sound up, please. It's going to be better than um, a panel of board certified physicians, I'm not sure from what medical school, to do home-based diagnostics. And several companies have now started developing these technologies. One of them, uh, uh, down, the, down the hall from me, is paired up with IDEO, a design firm, to take a look at the not-so-distant future, take a look at where it may go. It seems stuck on the first note. Wow. Let's try that again. I can, I can talk to it if it doesn't. Well, 
seems off, but here you see a little family with a young kid. He's got a rash, not sure what's going on, but they can take a smartphone picture and the AI engine can say, what rash is that? Oh, it's just roseola, so he can stay at home, right? No problem, right? So uh, roseola, that kind of stuff can be diagnosed with pattern recognition. Dermatologists are in trouble, right? So he can rest at home, he's very excited. Um, you can see now, you know, the ability for a patient now to get home-based uh, alerts, you know, based on the neighborhood they're in. Whooping cough is coming, all right? So maybe their kids need to be uh, uh, vaccinated or reboosted. So you can make an appointment right down the street instead of making a phone call and being on hold for t two hours. We're seeing the ability now with his point of care diagnostics to do better diagnostics. It's two in the morning, your kid's sick, you know, what do they have? Well, you may have an AI engine on your phone. It knows who your child is, their background, what their symptoms are. Now with a point of care urinalysis tool, you can basically just dip this and take a picture with your smartphone. You can do a UA. UTI suggests a physician visit or an ER visit, you can find the nearest ER right away, what the wait time is, and go. So a combination of these things are coming together. There's no one piece that's not here today, but when you can sort of, the tagline is, you know, measure your vital signs as often as you check your email, uh, there's interesting opportunities for those who don't check your email too often. So um, that's where some of these diagnostics are coming together. Uh, what gets interesting, and I've got actually one of the prototypes in my pocket, I can basically just hold this to my forehead and get my heart rate, my O2 sat, my temperature, my respiratory rate, um, and even relative blood pressure. And this isn't science fiction, this is actually out today, uh, or about to be launched. They've actually partnered with, the FDA is actually very involved in these tricorder projects. They've actually launched this on a crowdsourcing site. They broke the record, I think $1.5 million in sales to do their crowdsource their clinical trial for this in the, in the endeavor. So, and the FDA is playing a smart role in that to enable these when they, when they do come out. So keep your eye on that, on that arena. Um, and that enables better than connected health. Of course, now it's an age where this data can be connected to your clinician, your nurse practitioner. We're understanding that the social network is increasingly important to leverage change because we know most of our, our, our behavior, our, our medical issues aren't from our genetics, it's from our behaviors. And we know behavior change, what we need to do, eat less, you know, exercise more, it's hard to do. So we're leveraging technologies in new ways to understand that. One of my favorite startups out of the Bay Area called Amada Health is taking folks who are pre-diabetic using tools that are well described in the, in the old fashioned role, but now putting together virtually, sort of virtual support groups. Everyone gets a connected health scale. They can support each other. These are pre-diabetics and they're bending the curve in those who, the, to those who end up becoming type two diabetics, all through smart platforms. We're seeing the ability to use augmented reality. What if you're trying to lose weight and you can see the future you every day in the morning, right? Or those of you who had too many donuts this morning, you know, what happens if you go the other direction, right? <laughs> That's a powerful tool, right? Now, you don't need to wait for that. You can actually go down and load several apps. One's called Fatify. Here's me now. Here's me after 100, 100 donuts later, right? <laughs> so I'm going to remember that when I reach a Dexter Donut. That changes my behavior, right? And that can be for smoking, for all sorts of other behaviors. Very, very powerful. We're using the new world of robotics to enhance our ability to visit not just our, our loved ones across the planet, but for clinicians. And this is pretty advanced new uh, uh, telerobotics have been FDA approved actually, 510K, to enable really, I uh, can as a hematologist visit anywhere in the world. We're seeing robotics leveraged with brain computer interface so that someone is paralyzed now with a chip on their brain, this is work at a Brown University, just by thinking alone, this is last year published in Nature, by thinking alone, can give herself her first drink of coffee uh, in 16 years, she's been paralyzed, uh, quadriplegics. And we're gonna see that change the world of, of the, the disabled. We're seeing uh, robotics engage the, the just paralyzed or those with muscle weakness, the world of exoskeletons, a wearable robotics that enables someone who's uh, paralyzed from the waist down to now walk. These are in trials in the VA. So really inter interesting implications there. Of course, we actually wanna cure spinal cord injury. So some of the great promise there is in my, my research field has been regenerative medicine. Anyone recognize the guy on the left? No one recognizes him. He just won the Nobel Prize in Medicine a year ago, right? Shin Yamanaka developed induced pluripotent stem cells, which, as you may know, can enable everything from developing any sort of tissue, but are very, getting very important in developing drugs for screening tools. We can 3D print micro livers. We're leveraging, again, 3D printing now. Uh, you can 3D print all sorts of objects, but we're moving that into the world of biology. So we can now print micro livers and screen a patient's individual patient for drugs or help develop more uh, per personalized drugs. So 3D, 3D printing is moving into the medical world from uh, personalized uh, uh, ear, ear, ear pieces to prosthetics that match the other leg to ones that match a face that might be destroyed by cancer. Uh, to even blending with bionics. So $6 million man isn't too far behind. We're seeing um, the evolution of 3D printing already in basic organs like tracheas and bladders. And in the future, uh, we'll be possibly making very advanced organs out of your own stem and progenitor cells. So a lot happening in that realm. I, as mentioned in the introduction, in, I'm a bone marrow transplant doc. I developed a better tool for harvesting 
bone marrow stem cells and actually developed a new approach using antibodies to knock out the bad hematopoietic stem cells as well so we can change the way we do transplant. Um, and I'll just mention my mentor at Stanford, Irv Weissman, is really thinking differently about pharma and using this new anti-CD47 monoclonal, monoclonal antibody type approach to potentially really disrupt the way we do cancer care. So take a look at the anti-CD47 story when you get a chance. Okay. Now, it's not just enough about um, you know, having new technologies, it's how it's paid, how it's regulated, and, and how you think about putting these things together differently. So why am I, as a hema pediatric uh, internal medicine doc, talking to you about technology? Well, I've been the chair of a new program for the last five years called, of the medicine component of a new program called Singularity University. It's based at NASA Ames in the heart of Silicon Valley. And we bring together current and future leaders to cross-train in medicine, biotech, robotics, AI, nano, space, et cetera, and think about where's the puck going? How can we leverage technology in smart ways to reinvent the future? Um, including thinking of ways, for example, taking drones, which are getting popular, not to deliver bombs, but to deliver drugs and vaccines. So there's a company called Matternet using those to hop around like a Pony Express. Uh, we've had several other very interesting examples like you know, telemedicine in a glove. Uh, that have been developed by some of our students. And because the medicine area has been so impactful and interesting, I put together a program three years ago called Future Med, where we bring together physicians, pharma, device, investors, folks from across the spectrum, and we look at where technology can be re reinvented. So check out futuremed2020.com, and we're doing a, a larger program at the Hotel Del Coronado in a month and a half, uh, so hope some of you can join us there. And, and we'd love to have you there in terms of helping rethink and reinvent the future of medicine. Okay. Now, part of the future of health, medicine, and pharma is bringing new people into the fold, right? It's not just the traditional doc or drug and device people. There's a new explosion in this interest, partially mediated by the world of, of our friends at HHS. They've opened up the data pipes, and there's now health hackathons, and there's uh, incubators and accelerators and designers coming into the fold. And in terms of thinking, uh, even, the, you know, we've re realized you, you have to have smart user interface. You need to think differently, like just in flying, I'll use some analogies from flying. If I'm going to go back to San Francisco, I don't want to put wings on my car. I want a, a jet or a 747. And there's lessons from aviation that we can apply to, to healthcare. Um, I've been a pilot since college, um, learned to fly when I was an undergrad at Brown, and then later joined the Air National Guard as a flight surgeon. So I've served for the last 10 or 12 years uh, uh, with a series of fighter pilots flying and get to fly in the backseat. And there's lessons from aviation to apply to medicine. One of them Dr. Woodcock uh, just mentioned was checklists, right? That's dramatically changed checklists. Uh, the, uh, the way we've been thinking about how we do things in the operating room. We don't cut off the wrong leg. There's that, you know, no picture. You don't get that shock when you take off the wrong leg or kidney. That's being applied in emergency situations. It's being appified now. So you can personalize checklists, not just, you know, in the OR, but pre-op and post-op and when folks are home in terms of care and beyond. We're seeing the uh, example of simulation train change how we do flying and making it safer. And that's being applied essentially to our own bodies. We can now make flight simulators for the body. That's changing how we do education, how we do training. Uh, it's not just on individual procedures, it's stressing the whole team. It's being used in drug development and drug trials to predict and simulate trials before they happen uh, and look at molecular biology in the level. We have new sim centers like this one at Stanford where the old model was see one, do one, teach one, and now it's sim one, sim one, sim one until you get it right and bring teams together and stress them to fail and then debrief and show them what they did wrong in a very non-judgmental way and that's dramatically improving outcomes. Other lessons from flying are that of heads-up displays. In the cockpits of the fighter world, uh, or, or the airplane world, we've gone from the analog cockpit to the digital cockpit. And that can enable all this big data to be sifted and sh um, shaped in, in new ways. In, in fact, Lockheed Martin that develops fighter jets is now helping Ho Johns Hopkins up the road develop the next generation ICU. In the fighter pilot world, we use what's called heads-up displays. That allows us to sort information uh, and give a, a dashboard right when we need it. And there's going to be dashboards increasingly in healthcare and in drug development. So you need different information if you're sort of landing in bad weather and you might need a cue that you need to pull up before you're landing short or hitting a mountain. Or um, if you're in a dogfight, you need dramatically different information as well. So we're learning how to use that kind of information in healthcare, just like we're putting it in our cars. And we'll soon have you know, our healthcare GPS. You know, Take a right and go to the gym, not left to McDonald's, right? Um, and you need your own sort of cues. Not everyone needs the same sort of cues. And of course, we don't want to be overwhelmed by this data, you know, Starbucks, uh, and, and get uh, overwhelmed. So how do, you, you know, how do you use this for the patient, the clinician, pharma, and beyond? Again, so much information. Uh, how do we make it useful? So part of that useful is, is how we view things. Uh, in development are actually assisted living contact lenses. Imagine having the internet ported to your eyeballs. Well. That's not so far away. There's some interesting implications, but now we're in the age, of course, of, of Google Glass, right? I have mine right here. Let's see. Um, you can all try them on later, right? These are not quite out yet, but I've got an early pair. Oh, you look pretty. Take a picture. 
Okay, smile. All right. All right. And you know, so these have interesting implications. Um, for example, uh, how we might be doing our exercise. You know, we can see the world in new ways. Um, and and uh, it looks like we're just lying on the carpet and flailing around, but we're actually sort of you know flying through space and and exercising here. Let's see that in a second. Here he goes. Ooh, that looks like fun. Or maybe we have our contact lenses or our glass on and. We're on a date and we need a little help, so we uh, bring up the Wingman app, right? And um, that could be helpful in certain settings. Uh, right to Facebook. Um, but if you think about it, and I actually got to show these to the FDA commissioner a month or two ago, there's really inter interesting implications in these for healthcare. Imagine you're an ICU doctor and you can look at your data from, uh, from a patient in real time, or you're a patient and you can see your meds and it can sort and tell what you just took uh, and track those, or your vital signs during exercise. Um, one of our, our um, students who's a surgeon who came to FutureMed was the first one to bring in the operating room so he could be mentored or mentor somebody else. There's going to be a huge number of, just like you couldn't imagine what was developed on the iPhone and Android platforms, a huge number of apps and things will be developed on these as they get better and better. So watch this space, uh, literally. And so you may be watching your breakfast differently again, and you'll see this before, and, and maybe this will be your new view, and you'll have a different uh, cue, right? <laughs> and you might even have auditory cues. Uh, like this, the, the sound of those, pull up, pull up, is the little auditory cue you get from the, from the flight surgeon world. OK. So to finish up, I'm a little slow on time here. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of, lot of lessons, uh, including you know, sh uh, things coming to our eyeball, but um, one of the interesting implications, I think, across healthcare is, is this idea of big data, but making it, making it actionable, like radar. What if all the patients on our trial you could see and know which ones had certain genotypes and where the thunderstorms were and how to reroute them in real time as opposed to months later? What if just like with our driving apps, we give up a little bit of privacy, but now when you drive, like this is the Waze app, you can build Rome in a day just from the driver data. And you share that data, but you get information back, like where's the bad traffic, and where's the police hanging out, what's the best route to work or to school, uh, where are the hazards. That's the unsiloing of data. If we can start to share this in smart ways, we get better clinical trials, better outcomes, and more insight as, as physicians, patients, payers, and pharma. So, you know, medicine's ripe for change. You know, in many ways we've been flying blind. Now we have, you know, emerging cheap genomics, this new world of sensors, uh, synthetic biology, crowdsourced data, crowdsourced clinical trials, the, world, the new drug of the empowered patient. We can have new dashboards into what's happening in our communities just by, you know, Google flu trends, for example, it can tell you which neighborhood has influenza and that might change how you do uh, uh, diagnostics and therapy. We'll have new ways of seeing that data, crowdsourcing it, realizing that the social network can be very, very powerful. So you might you know, change who you shake hands with each day or understand some of the risk profiles there. Uh, this, is not, this is not science fiction. You can tell today, this has been studied with Facebook, who in your social network is going to get influenza and when, and potentially who to avoid. So that's not, not far out as well either. So new ways of seeing this data, um, new ways of integrating it, making contextual. And I would challenge you to add design thinking to whatever you're doing in your new clinical trial designs, in your new drug designs, making it, making it interactive and, and sometimes fun and engaging. Uh, that's going to help things. And, and shift where healthcare has been from one that's been traditionally very episodic and reactive. You have the pain and you make the call and see your doc two or three days later, or you have the stroke or heart attack and discover the tumor. You know, phase three, phase four, phase, uh, stage three or four kind of um, medicine. And shift this to a new world of continuous and proactive, where we can have the data continuously and be proactive and, and catch things early. I like to call it stage zero medicine, in, in some cases curing the well before they get sick. And, and I think it's the bringing of all this together that's going to shift things together. For example, uh, changing our perspective of being not just organ donors or, or, or blood donors, but becoming data donors. Or in the world, my world of oncology, thinking about personalized oncology. Every tumor will be sequenced. We'll have expression profiles. We'll be able to meld that over time and improve that from cancer stem cells and personalized markers and beyond. And, and even rethink the world of compliance. Uh, I've, I'm engaged in a new startup company I would love your help with, thinking about, you know, instead of giving five meds to a person not based on their pharmacogenics or data, what if we could actually 3D print their own pill, essentially, starting with generic APIs and build a pill even at the point of care. So anybody here who does reformulation or thinks about um, compounding, please come talk to me. Uh, but we're actually well on the way of building this uh, sort of system out. Um, okay, so I challenge you in whatever you're doing to think about the trajectory of technology. Some are exponential, some are just moving quickly, and how you might leverage those into whatever you're doing in the world of medicine, pharma, and regulatory. Because in many ways, you know, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed, kind of like my Google Glass. And you are the folks who don't just need to sort of predict the future, but can go out there and create it.
So with that, I'll say uh, thanks very much. Uh.